All right. This is how I'm recording the nasty interview answers. Um, so question one, radical iconography productions intersects where research as a field from an avant-garde perspective. What was the first purpose you set for yourself? What do you hope this project will bring to the artistic scene? What ones do you thought? Do you think it could be tonight that are not going to be considered? So I've worked in the field of art and music pretty much my entire career, working with bands was the way that I collaborated mostly. Most of my collaborations, if you could call collaborations, are with bands doing album covers and just all the, the imagery surrounding the release of an album, merchandise, et cetera. Um, and it's always been somewhat of a struggle at the beginning. It wasn't when everybody was broke, nobody had any money and uh, it was just friends doing stuff for friends. Right. That was, that was the fun. But when it started getting serious, um, of course it got more complicated and a big part of that complication is just the record industry and the way that the record industry is set up. Um, I remember a friend in the record industry explaining to me a long time ago that like this is like the record industry is on a, a system that is a hundred years old or like the system of the record industry is something that was established a hundred years ago and hasn't really been updated and um that really has stuck with me since as kind of like an explanation on to a lot of a lot of the issues that i've had with the music industry the visual side of music i feel has become more and more important almost over the years especially with uh the internet etc um there's just a lot more need for visuals to go along with music than there used to be um, because we have all these new opportunities for showcasing visuals along with music from you know music videos uh a while back but now with the internet there's all these different uh visual avenues, uh, Spotify, visualizers, uh, of course, music videos. There's more music videos than there used to be now because there's YouTube and people are self-publishing, etc. cetera. Um, but the role of the artist hasn't, the visual artist, I should say, hasn't been, um, hasn't been what, what would be the word, hasn't been elevated in that, in this process as well. I don't, I think maybe that's the word, but um, even though those visuals are more meaningful than they've ever been, really, the emphasis on the artist behind it hasn't taken any sort of significance or any significant role. And that's something that I, I really want uh, to change. Um, visual artists working alongside of musicians rather than the dynamic always of you know musicians make an album and work with a record label or and then they go find the the artists etc um good stuff obviously comes from that process but at the same time if you create a symbiotic relationship between artists and a uh, true collaboration that's when like the really cool work happens and everybody can really benefit and the intellectual property of the band being like their name and like their community etc and can be used to greater effect uh band or excuse me uh fans of bands can connect with the artists on a deeper more meaningful level um through these channels so that's really the main objective, I guess, when it comes to, to RIP is to really create the bridge between the artists and to bring the visual aspect of the music listening experience to the forefront uh, in a very meaningful way along with the musician because that's also something that I've come across. I've been interviewing a lot of musicians and speaking with a lot of bands of all kinds um, and specifically asking on certain instances, like what, what uh, were you unhappy with, with the way that your last album was released? What were you unhappy with about how the visual aspect of 
the album rollout went, et cetera. And I hear a lot about how the record labels just don't understand a lot of the time, the nuances, even if the band is really interested in doing something, you know, very interesting, avant-garde, mysterious, what have you, uh, visually or along with the visuals to emphasize the music. Um, the record label rarely understands that. They rarely want to put the money behind it and even more than the money, like the time or like the care, or, like maybe the people that are working for the, the record label, maybe they don't even honestly care about that aspect of it because like I said, the music industry is 100 years old. There's just, you know, straight up business people up in there that don't, you know, not that they don't care about the art, but maybe they aren't even capable of understanding some of the things that these really you know, dynamic artists want to do. Um, so yeah, all that being said, uh, at the end of the day, just trying to fill what I feel is a big gap out there for, for bands and artists, artists that want to work with bands and bands that want to work with artists where the care, the time can be put in the collaboration into, uh, all those rich possibilities that can be done when presenting new music to the world or just music in general to the world. There's so many opportunities and in ways to do that, that can engage the fans. Um, so, and that really goes back to just me personally, because as a, uh, when I, when I really fell in love with music, I was, uh, pretty young in my early, not even teens yet, I guess, you know, like 11, 12, and then 13 was really an age where, uh, I really fell in love with music due to some trauma in my life. But, um, like music was what I really identified with then and really latched onto and kind of the world that I went into. And so um, back then being creative, even as a child, I was never happy just being a passive listener to music. I wanted to participate somehow. And so I was always part of street teams. Um, I would go to shows and hand out stickers and, and CDs and tapes and stuff like that. You would sit outside of the event and hand that shit out and just kind of be a, ambassador for the band. Um, I lived in Wisconsin at the time, so I think I was probably the only one in all of Wisconsin. I would go to Milwaukee and hand out tapes and network with a lot of people and bands. Even as a young kid, I was going to these shows and uh, interacting with the band a lot of times because I would get backstage passes and shit like that. So I was never happy just being a passive listener to music. And, um, and yeah, and so I guess I really want to, uh, what would be the word for I want to bring that back. I really think like that that's another thing that's missing in the music industry right now is that like that kind of community around the artists. There is that definitely online and stuff like that, but like those street team days back in the day is more so what I'm going to. I trailed off big time there. Um, next question. What qualities, including and especially unexpected or unconventional ones, do you look for in the talents you work with? Are there non-negotiable traits that must have, on the other hand, what aspects of you and are find intolerable, actively opposed? Um, I like to say that RIP supports fearless creators. Um, it sounds good. That's that sounds really good. Um, but I, people have called me fearless, but I don't consider myself fearless because I feel like I'm I'm ruled by fear. Um, I'm pretty hard on myself when it comes to that. So, um, but I guess it does stand fearless creators. Like, I only want to work with people who are doing interesting things, new things, pushing boundaries. I'm, I'm never interested in like, oh, that's a really good version of what a whole bunch of other people did. Like that never entertains me. Um, so even if, uh, well, no, I guess just that, like pushing boundaries, trying new things, curiosity, willingness uh, to try new things, I guess, willingness to experiment people and, and artists and creatives who aren't just set in a way or like not even set in a way, but just kind of like, so a lot of bands that I come to have a set idea or that come to me, I should say a lot of bands that come to me have a set idea in their head of exactly what they want or exactly what it is. I shouldn't say that, like not exactly what they want, but 
they basically want me to copy myself. And that's really something that over the last few years, I've just kind of cut out. Like I'm now at the point where I just will not even entertain that. And so it's kind of that where it's uh, musicians who are willing to experiment and willing to take the process and go where the process leads them, not where they wish it would go or some preconceived notion or whatever. And I guess that's just the willingness to experiment. And it is, I guess, a fearlessness. And I guess in that regard, I am rather fearless when it comes to creating imagery, but when it comes to living life, I don't know so much. But, um, and then intolerable is, yeah, that inflexibility. Uh, I find it intolerable when you put something in front of somebody's face that's amazing, like an amazing art piece or an amazing uh, visual. And the only reason that they don't like it is just because it doesn't fit what they had in mind already. Um, that that's just how to create stagnation um so that's a huge thing that i've run into a lot lately a lot of a lot of bands that i work with or have tried to work with me lately i run into that where they're not open to to what is great right in front of them and the thing when it comes to working with uh like a a, a musician working with a visual artist is that oftentimes the musician doesn't have the time to be as uh visually adept as the artist um whereas the artist will have been processing imagery on a daily basis you know for their every day for their, their lifetime right so they start at least this is how it works for me picking out visual trends at a point you can start to see what's going to come next etc cetera, etc cetera. and when you're working with a client and the client is stuck with what they've seen you already do and they want you to do that again and then it, they're closed off when you show them something that you know is is even better and could even get a better response than what they wanted, but they're closed off to it because they just had something in their mind already. Um, that is not um, a good way to produce uh, meaningful work or that's just not how to collaborate either, in my opinion. So it's like, these are a few examples of, of things. And then other intolerable activities that I oppose is just like laziness and it's just taking the, the fastest route, the easiest route. Um, even, even just when, like, if a band really cares or a musician really cares, they should pick out the artist they want to work with. Um, maybe they don't have the lexicon uh, or I guess like the Rolodex of artists to know who would be the best or whatever. So they have to kind of be a little bit more open and work with other people and take advice, et cetera, et cetera. But I do feel that musicians and artists, if they're working on a very meaningful project to them, they should pick out the artist. And once they pick out the artist that they want to work with, they should stick with that artist. They should they shouldn't have just like a number and like any of them will do um, because you're going to get less meaningful work that way. You should really like I feel that artists should pick out the artists they want to work with and stick with it and make it work. Say identify that artist. This is the person that can visualize you know the world that i'm trying to build with my music the best and i'm not going to cut corners or be lazy just because the timing didn't work out perfect for that instance or something like that or for whatever you know like it should be very intentional there should be a lot more intention around the the visuals i guess this is even going back to the first question too but whatever um is what it is from a more personal perspective, what do these new steps for Ripper represent to you? What aspects of your artistic identity do you think have been unlocked? And what additional elements have contributed to your evolution as an artist? From a more personal perspective. I think, I, I mean, I don't, doesn't really answer the question, but it does mark a turning point for me where I am, I, I will be and rip will be very targeted on who it works with. Um, not just whoever comes knocking at the door. Um, yeah, I guess that's marks a big turning point for me, you know, um, not that I would just take anything always or whatever, but before it was always just waiting to see who comes to me and trying to make the connections and work that way or whatever. But now it's really targeted. Now it's like, who are my dream people to work with? I'm going to go after that. And I guess that's a turning point and just in a personal 
a personal turning point to just really going after what I want. No, um, I don't think that should be part of the interview, to be honest. That really doesn't fucking matter. Um, delving into the intersection of music and art and specifically your symbiotic relationship with the punk, metal and rock music scenes. That's my alarm for boxing. Um, so this won't last much longer. How much does this reveal about you and how finish your identity is it's all artists are connected to my answer to this would be I guess it's not wrong. I do have a symbiotic relationship with punk metal rock for sure um more metal rock I guess than punk 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 you know. punk runs deep um well first of all I do love hip hop. I do love rap just as much as anything else, honestly. And and that was probably the, my first love in music when I was a child was hip hop, actually. Like, like when I was really young, like crisscross, which <laughs> they were children that dressed like they grow their clothes backwards. <laughs> um, if you don't know what crisscross was. But then really shortly after that was like Trap Hill Quest and everything like that. Um, that old school hip hop. That was like the first thing that I really was into. I like beats and rhythm and stuff like that. Um, but then over the years, I started to really identify with more heavy, extreme music because I was, because of what I was feeling, because what I was going through, like, uh, so like more extreme and anger and stuff like that is what I was identifying with. So like, that's where the metal and that's where metal really came in and hardcore and that kind of stuff. That's what I was getting into. Um, in that, in my late teens, mid late teens, um, so anyways, um, how have they shaped my identity as well? I guess you can say that. Um, uh, do, 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 specific artist songs. I'm not going to say a specific artist or whatever. I always. I think I think that my musical taste probably reveal less about me, actually. Uh, if I were to be judged from the outside, people usually can think that I look like, you know, metal or punk or whatever, uh, something. Um, but like, like I said, like my if you come and look at my record collection, it's completely varied or whatever. So I would say I'm a lot more broad than people ever expect in my music listening. Um, I don't I, I grew up in a very small town, uh, in a, in a, in a, uh, a basically throwaway state, what they would, most people would consider from California would consider Wisconsin, you know, nothing. Um, and I'm from a very small town in Northern Wisconsin. So even more nothing. Um, so there was no subculture there. So I belonged to no subculture growing up. Um, I found what I liked through the internet. I got the internet at a very young age and I've created my own, my own perspective, I guess, my own subculture, because there was nothing else or whatever. So in that's a double edged sword where I was like, I didn't get locked in to anything. I wasn't like, well, this is what punk is. This is what metal is. This is what this is. So that's what I identify with. And that's what I am. I never had that. I never did that. I didn't have to do that to belong to any certain group like subcultures, even uh, the most subversive of subcultures have these kind of re guidelines and if you don't abide by the guideline may you're not part of the subculture maybe by definition right so but i never had that because i never was even participating in a subculture so i would take this from this that from that and it didn't matter nobody was around to say that's not metal that's not whatever um and i'm like just aside i was new metal growing up if you want to categorize and classify so growing up being that I really loved hip hop and I still did grow. Uh, and then I got into metal or whatever. I was identifying with new metal. I was wearing like super baggy clothes and Jenkos and kickwear and fucking corn shirts and limp biscuit shirts and slipknot and sepultura. And, uh, and then like, you know, cradle of filth and shit like that, but then also tribe called quest and whatever else. And, kind of blending a bunch of stuff. And then I would go to high school and just get my ass kicked no matter what, because everybody else was driving pickup trucks because they were working on the farms in the morning and, or working on the farms at night and shit like that. And they were all listening to country at the time, like 
I don't even know who the big artist would have been, but it was like that pop country where it was like Shania Twain and then what like Tim McGraw. I don't know what the fuck else. But so anyways, I'm saying this all to get to the point of that. Um, what how it shaped me was that I was able to take whatever I wanted from all these little and create my own identity out of the pieces or whatever. Unlike, you know, if I would have grown up in a city and I was trying to fit in with the certain subculture of yada yada i would have probably went deeper and more down one road rather than down a whole bunch of roads you know and and tried a bunch of stuff and tried to combine it all or whatever so i guess that's how it has shaped my identity like um and then even to this day whatever i'm trying to identify with and not that I don't really consider identity or having, I don't have a set identity. It's always moving around based on what I need it for. And so when I'm working on artwork, it depends on the artwork that either I need to for a client or I want to for myself, but I listen to the kind of music that I want to inspire the artwork, I guess. And it works every time. Right. But um, in doing that, because I'm embodying the music so much, that's what it feels like. Like when I listen to the music, I can embody it. And therefore I'm able to, uh, process it and then, you know, visualize, I guess you could say, or whatever. So it's very important. I listen to the correct, you could say, kind of music to vibrate on the frequency that I'm trying to work in. Um, but it really deeply affects me in that way. But um, yeah. So yeah, as far as identity, um, I don't identify with anything. Uh, that's a Zen quote that I actually ever hear, ever since first hearing it, I, I keep very close to heart is uh, identify with nothing. That's it. It's a very simple quote. And I mean, like literally. Um, and then, yeah, uh, I use music. It's like a drug in a way or whatever. You know, it's like our costume that I put on. It's a drug that I take uh, or whatever. So, yeah, maybe that answered that question. I don't know. <laughs> Concerning the T-shirt drop, what marks Rip's new step as a clothing brand? What is behind the choice of those specific graphics and prints? Um, bah, bah, bah. I've always made shirts, I don't know, for like, fuck, how long? Seven, eight, nine, ten years? I don't know. I've been producing shirts at a small scale, uh, always selling out, of course, you know, doing low run, selling out. And then on like the process just became a little too much just for one person for me to cont continuously do consistently, et cetera. So I would do it when I can. Um, but now, you know, this will be a consistent thing. I've always wanted it to be consistent thing. I needed a team around me in order to, to do that. And, um, so that's what we're, we're working on now to get that going because, um, cause there's a market for it. People want it. I'm always being asked, always getting both in person at my shows and, and also, uh, online asking when, when am I ever going to make new shirts for sell online? I think my net, my last shirt wasn't even sold online. It was only available at my show. Uh, physically in Los Angeles. So, I mean, I haven't released uh, a t-shirt available to the broad public in like over four years, probably pre-pandemic. Um, and then the choice of the graphics, um, I kind of just picked the strongest graphics, pieces that I've wanted to see on shirts for a long time. Um, and then I wanted to print them in like the most bold, striking way possible. I wanted to do one layer screen prints, but like the best possible way, um, the best shirts that I could do with sewn in tags. It's basically the idea for this run, and it won't always be, was like the best band t-shirt you've ever seen. But instead of it being a band, it, it's an artist. But personally, the best t-shirts for that I, th what I think are the best t-shirts are band t-shirts. Like you go to a store, a very high-end store, and you pay three hundred dollars for a t-shirt that at the end of the day isn't it as good or you don't as like as much as the band t-shirt you bought at the show uh for twenty five dollars forty dollars um a few nights before and and that's what i've always thought was kind of silly so brands are always ripping off bands brands are always ripping off bands that was another another thing i've always noticed like just make shirts as good like find a better way than just ripping it off and trying to make it seem like your fashion brand that's not associated with music is a band or something. They make your shit look like it's a band and then all weird. I don't know. It was just, 
a weird dynamic and it's like there's a better way to do this and that's what i'm looking to do and so basically i'm taking my best graphics or my most I, some of my most iconic pieces uh or pieces that i've really wanted to see printed on a shirt in this way uh that's the first run here and then from here there's going to be a lot of experimenting we're going to see color prints and whatever we have um spent a lot of time identifying a great screen printer right here in los angeles that i'm working with very hands-on driving up there myself all the time to go to the studio or go to his shop, work hands-on with him in every step of the process. Um, and I'll continue to do that. And we will see a progression in these shirts. We'll see um, increase in quality, both in the print and the t-shirts in every way. I'm really excited. There's no rules and there's no set way of doing it. So just basically this first, this first capsule collection is, is the experiment in a way and uh just kind of the, the first run uh to get it out of the way this was like what i've i wanted just like let's make the best band t-shirt possible throw the the best tags on it that we can make uh cut no corners um and that's what we got here for the first one um it also also there's nfts that come with everyone and um the nfts aren't just some bullshit sales technique it's the opposite really because it's not even a sales technique it's a way to uh give more with the shirts because everything is kind of a key to the digital side of things where there's going to be a con uh, entire ecosystem around radical iconography productions that um nfts will come with assets that fans can use and once they use the assets can submit them back to us and stuff like that also you know extra imagery a way of showing behind the scenes stuff things that lead up to the end product that you normally don't get to see. Um, just a lot of that kind of stuff. We're going to put that all in these NFTs. And like, so basically you'll buy a shirt and then you'll have a whole bunch of videos and, and things to do as well. Like you can watch and, and explore deeper uh, what went into this shirt. What else is there around this ecosystem, et cetera. Um, that's one of the things I'm most excited about. As for the album Raining Cement being released for the first time on cassette, is there an artistic difference you aim to capture in the 12th and the even if it's empty, it's text, the collection images? I want to do a different cover. I want to do a cover that still made sense um, in a way, uh, given what the album is. Uh, if you were unfamiliar with Raining Cement, you can look that up and find the information on what that was about. Um, the NFT part of Rainy Cement is the coolest part about this. I love the cassette. Of course, I actually folded all of the inserts for that and everything myself just yesterday. Uh, each one is signed. We're only doing 50, super limited. It's ridiculous. We actually, tapes were made one place. We printed all of the J cards another place uh, so that we could have individual unique QR codes on every single one. There's so much detail that goes into all this shit. Um, but I assembled all of them yesterday. Um, and to me, the most exciting part is the NFT because Raining Cement is a project where I gave these noise uh, assets that I recorded, my field recordings, to musicians and had them make songs out of it, very simply. Um, those noise assets have never been, those field recordings, I mean, noise assets, have not been accessible or available um, outside of that project to those musicians, 20-some musicians initially ever before. With the NFT of this one, I'm including those, and I'm including them as open source as well so that people can actually take all those same uh, field assets, my field assets, and and use them if they would like and and participate in the, like, the Raining Cement project. And I'm hoping that people actually submit and we're going to have a submission page um, where people can submit the things that they make with some of these assets that we're giving people. Um, and I'm hoping to to be able to use it and, and have kind of a, a creator community led community. You know what I mean? Um, so that's a really fun part of it, like the NFT and like being able to distribute things to a community through these NFTs with the hopes of, you know, building the community and, and encouraging participation. Going back to what we said earlier, like actually handing out ways for people to become active participants instead of, you know, passive fans. Um, Good artists do bad things is one of your key identifiers. Represent a dichotomy between good and evil, right and wrong. In your view, what elements make someone a good artist and what indicates a success, unsuccessful one? 
in terms of bad things, where is the line drawn? What is permissible to still be considered artistic? And from a personal artistic standpoint, what do you define? How do you define your own figure? Um, that's too much. Um, <laughs> in, I'm going to pick it apart. In your elements make someone, or in your view, what elements make someone a good artist and what indicates an unsuccessful one? Irrelevant. That's irrelevant to the point of the of the quote, good artists do bad things. So I'll just take that out right away. Um, in terms of bad things, the different things are. Okay. Good artists do bad things is a turn of phrase or whatever you want to call it, a quote that I've had in mind for over a year now, for years, I guess. Um, it started really simple and has kind of taken on a lot of meaning over the years. Um, but really it can be taken first of all at face value, good artists do bad things because you could really say that everybody does bad things. It's human nature. So that's part of it. Um, and then, so like, instead of just everybody substitute good artists, um, and the reason for doing that is because people hold artists to higher standard for some reason. Um, nobody's canceling the homeless guy down the road. Nobody's canceling uh, the random, uh, you know, guy who works at Target. Nobody, I don't know how it works in business culture, office culture, I should say. But um, I know that there's rep, like people get reprimanded and shit like that. But like, the only people who are canceled publicly and their lives completely destroyed are artists uh, of all kinds, actors and public figures, I guess. I guess politicians too. Politicians are not artists. Maybe bullshit artists are what politicians are. But, um, and it's not just a, a reflection on cancel culture either, but that's a, that is part of it. Um, I hate that term even, you know, it's, it's so overplayed at this point. And I think we're at a turning point where it's not as much of a thing anymore, but, um, it's basically good artists do bad things to saying like, Hey, Hey, like, even if your favorite artist did something that you don't like, you don't have to throw away their artwork. You don't have to not like their artwork anymore because everybody does something bad, has done something bad, has hurt somebody, has hurt themselves, have, and, and, and then second of all, what is a bad thing? That's subjective, right? So like, I mean, <laughs> uh, that's, it, just that, like, you know, um, and good artists again, go back to the, like what I said, wasn't, was irrelevant. It's subjective as well. Right. But it doesn't matter because you can bet that every good artist has done something bad guaranteed that to what degree don't know, but also it's the artist's responsibility to provoke and to push the line to, uh, I guess just make people think and, and to provoke. And um, I never know my own line until I cross it, until I have gone over it and I say, oh shit, fuck. <laughs> and I feel like shit and I fucking, you know, I feel guilt and bad and stuff. And then I'm like, that was a line, I guess, for me where, and then I know not to cross it again and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, where is the line? Like, you don't know it until you cross it. It changes for everybody and everybody has their own lines as what they will accept as well, I guess, you know, like, it's a personal thing, but at the end of the day, the statement means good artists do bad things. Um, and many times it's the artist's responsibility maybe to do the bad things, uh, to act as the surrogate for the public, maybe even to express some of those darker impulses or something. Um, you know, there's surely lots of studies done about that. Um, but to cap this up, um, besides it being, you know, like, I just mean a good artist do bad things, uh, get over it um i also mean it, it's kind of a it, it's also my statement for the arts i wanted it to be like um a psa for the arts you know just in case you didn't know <laughs> good artists do bad things um and it's okay uh the art's still good um you can still like the art um just to cap this up though i read a book last summer uh and i think that's what gave me the um the courage to 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 make go public with this statement and name my show this last uh 
I had a show in Milan in March, I think it was March or April, um, the, of the same title. It was more of an activation. Um, and I plan to use the title for a lot more. Um, but yeah, I guess being on the shirts now is the next stage uh, of this. But I read a book last summer uh, called Monsters. Or is it just Monster? Monsters are mon I want to get this right so that I'm not I'm going to look up Monster. Uh, Claire. Yeah, Claire D. Durer. It's called Monsters, A Fan's Dilemma. Claire D. Durer. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the dur right, but um, monsters a fan's dilemma, and then like the tagline I guess for it was like what to do with the great art from terrible men, um, and I didn't want to read that book at first. When I first heard about it, I was like fuck that, and then later on, for some reason, I really came around to it, and like I I saw what what happened is I saw it. Well, no, that's not even what happened. Is that I was listening to music. I was listening to a, a few albums, I guess, by canceled musicians and um, people who are canceled in the mainstream culture and was like, you know what? I still like this music. I don't care what, what anybody says. I don't care, <laughs> you know, if, if what if, if I guess I got I was like, I don't care if people even know that I love this and they like, hate me for it because I think they're wrong. And um where was I? Where was I going with this? I read this book. It was called Monsters of Fans Dilemma. And it gave me the courage that I would go, you know, I would use this statement. And I um in, in the book basically said exactly what I just said, where where it was like you can still like the art, even if the person did, you know, what you consider something terrible or what even everybody uh should <laughs> what you should consider a terrible thing um you can still appreciate the art from that person um and at the end of the day um that that's the statement uh it's a statement for the arts uh um i highly recommend the book monsters uh i don't know um what other people will think of it or if people will agree or disagree but it's written by a woman uh named claire de Durr, um and she makes a strong case uh, for a lot of a lot of the points that I agree with. So I would highly recommend reading the book Monsters. Um, and then just to go even a little bit further, and I do need to leave, um, but to go a little bit further, because like the newest incarnation of how I've been thinking about the quote or whatever, or thinking about, it's not even the quote anymore. It's that like, okay, I really, I don't care anymore. I appreciate the good art of what are considered terrible people or people who've done wrong things, you know? um bad things um okay cool i'm i'm over that like i'm not i'm not part of i'm not a culture a victim of the culture in that way anymore so uh then it became even like well where it's kind of drawing from another aspect but this idea that like art is coming ideas artistic ideas and creativity is kind of coming from the ether that's how it comes to me at least like it feels like it's coming to me from something else and I was extrapolating on that idea of like, if that were to be true and we're all pulling from some sort of reservoir of ideas, um, all art is kind of created by everybody and anybody could have created anything. And, and in that way, like everybody created everything and yada, yada. And that's kind of a crazy big idea or whatever. But if you bring that to the idea of good artists doing bad things, you can kind of just consider the artist was the vessel for that idea and for that art. And, um, so that's almost a way for people to get around it of being like, well, I really disagree with what that person did, but that, but they were just the road that this art took to get to me now, you know, like, and I'm not, you know, that road, the road can't, you know, even if I hate that road, I'm not going to hate the destination. <laughs> that's ridiculous, <laughs> but I love it. Okay. Peace. I'm going to go box. Uh, I don't know if this was terrible, whatever. Okay, just one more thing here because I wanted to touch on just the name Radical Iconography Productions, RIP. Um, the name originated from the term Radical Iconography. That term was something coined by the artist uh, Fosco Valentini. 
uh, an Italian artist I met while I was staying in Southern Switzerland uh, last summer. Um, I don't know a specific age, but it's late seventies or eighties or something like that. And uh, we didn't, he didn't speak a lot of English. So we had a little bit of a language barrier between us, but um, could tell that there was, you know, a great artistic kinship there in some respects. And so um, we were at dinner one time, me and some friends and Fosco was with us. And uh, I don't even know what the topic was, but Fosco said to my friend, Jesse Draxler is the best artist at radical iconography in the world. And I overheard it because I think I was in a different conversation. I stopped and I was like, you say that again, what'd you say? And he said it and I was like, radical iconography, that's amazing. And I, I wrote it down or put it in my notes on my phone or something like that. Um, because it wasn't a term I had ever heard of before. And I, it, it's not a term, it's something that he came up with. And he actually had spent time looking at my work and thinking about it and coming up with that phrase to describe what it is my work was. And I had never had anybody do that before. I've never really done that myself. And so I guess it was the first time that somebody had put kind of a definition on my style. Um, and I really liked it and uh, I really appreciated it. I appreciate him. I love the guy for it so much. Um, so the name Ra or Radical Iconography came from that. And then when we were thinking about this brand, we were thinking the name radical iconography would be a great name but for me it felt a little flat and um rip kept on coming to mind and um that made sense rip felt right because it it's a sharp word it's it's it signifies something sharp it is sharp and everything for me is sharp i'm a precise person which is sharp i'm always cutting with an exacto knife knives in general, you know, just me, my identity, if I have one, uh, is in a way sharp, just in every way, mentally, just, I don't know, I, I am a sharp person, and rip is sharp. So it needed to be rip, not just radical iconography. And so it was very easy to add production, I think it was the first thing that came to mind. And I, I remember bringing it up to my partners and saying, it needs to be ripped. So instead, radical iconography and somebody else even I think said productions. And I was like, yeah, exactly. There we go. Um, and so those are some of the the names, the meanings of the name radical iconography productions, uh, rip for short and uh, rip. And rip has so many other signifiers too. Uh, it's one of my favorite words to describe something that's cool. That rips is great, you know, and everybody use it. And then also um, it's Halloween here in America coming up. So I see it all over the place because it's on gravestones. People just have it in their yards and it says rip. So there's all these great um, connections to the name rip that people can bring from all these different places like uh, in it. So it's, it's pretty cool. And then um, as we were talking about what rip actually is and dealing with intellectual property, um, then I started dealing with the I and the P from rip intellectual property. So it's kind of like reimagining intellectual property, radical iconography productions reimagining intellectual property and stuff like that. So it's just, you know, it's it's been around long enough that we've been playing with it, that it means so many different things at this point. But um, the basis of the name comes from Fosco and uh, him coming up with uh, Radical Iconography as a way to describe the overair of my work. Um, so yeah, yeah, I wanted to include that. 